Earlier this week, as our pastoral team met and prayed about how to lead our church through this time, one of the things that we talked about is, what are we going to continue to preach on? And so last Sunday, I preached a sermon specifically about what we were going through and what we were experiencing. But as we met this week and prayed, we felt that it was important to get back into our series in the Gospel of Luke. Luke is a biography written about Jesus from eyewitnesses who lived with Jesus. And so we've been in this series actually as a church for well over a year. We've been calling this Jesus Unfiltered because that's what Luke gives us. He gives us an unfiltered look at Jesus, stripped away from all the time and tradition have added over the times. This is from people who live with him. This is Jesus as he truly is. And our pastoral team felt that it was important to get back into our series really for two reasons. One, the Christian faith is founded upon Jesus. And so with so much turmoil going on in our life right now, what could be more crucial than making sure the foundation of our faith, our understanding of who Jesus is and what he actually taught, what could be more important than leaning into Jesus during this time? And also, since this outbreak has disrupted so much of our lives, we, we felt that it was important to not let it dictate every part of our lives. And so in some ways, we're engaging in a little form of protest this morning, a little bit of resistance as we go back to our regularly scheduled preaching diet. Uh, You can change where I'm allowed to go, but you can't change what I'm allowed to preach. And so we're going to get back into our regularly scheduled preaching diet and continue that throughout this time. So this morning we are going to be in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. Um, And I want to warn you up front that Jesus is going to jump into saying some pretty hard things here. And we're going, to have to get, we're going to have to do some work together to, to get at what he's teaching. But, but my hope is that by the end of the time, if you'll, if you'll hear Jesus out and what he's saying here, my, my hope is that we'll see actually how this is a tremendous act of his love. These are challenging words, but they're an expression of the profound love that he has for each and every one of us. So let's turn our attention to God's word now. I'm reading for what's known as the English Standard Version Starting in verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who begin to see it mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king at war, will not first sit down and deliberate deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends it a, a delegation and, and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Praise God for the, reaching, for the reading and the preaching of his word. You know, there's a common belief that we hear in our culture that all religions are, are essentially the same. They, 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 they come at God with with different ideas about God and different, certainly different rituals and expressions of faith. But essentially, they're all the same. They're all, they're all saying, hey, be good people who do good things and God will be good to you. Be good people who do good things and God will be good to you. You know, that's essentially what all Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and Jews and, and even some would say Christians, ultimately that's what they're after. 
I mean, based on your cultural heritage, you'll, you'll fall in line with one religion more than another. So, you know, most likely if you're, if you're Asian, you're more inclined to be Buddhist. If you're more uh, uh, American, you're probably going to be a greater chance of, of saying that you're a Christian. But, but really, how do you identify? We're told, we're told it doesn't make that big a difference. Because all religions are saying essentially the same thing. Here's the challenge with that cultural idea, though. Jesus never spoke about creating a religion. No, in fact, we've seen time and again in this biography, Jesus regularly challenged the most religious people of his day. Jesus never refers to religion in any of these biographies that we have of him. He he never refers to religion except usually with words of critique. He, He did not ever in any place lay down a set of rituals for people to follow or some kind of message about, about, about being good people. No, what Jesus spoke about is what we heard him repeating again and again throughout these ten verses we just read. He, he said it in three different places. He said in verse 26, he speaks about those who, who are his disciples. Again in verse 27, he mentions those who are his disciples. And then again in verse 33, he talks about those who are his disciples. Jesus' purpose was not to create a new religion. His purpose was to make disciples of himself. Jesus does not define his followers as those who are part of some religious sect called Christians. In fact, Jesus actually never even uses the word Christian. Jesus speaks only about people becoming his disciples. And please notice in verse 26, he starts by saying, if anyone, if anyone, right? Jesus is describing the most basic fundamental life of anyone who would come after him. This discipleship thing he's talking about it isn't some kind of, you know, spiritual version of specialized training for like, you know, the elite, the, the, the Navy SEALs of, of spiritual life. No, Jesus is saying that this idea of discipleship, this is the basic boot camp that everyone goes through who wants to enlist for him. Jesus said he came to make disciples. And so this morning as we make our way through these ten verses, I want us to see two things. I want us to see the definition of discipleship that Jesus gives, the definition of discipleship, And then number two, I want us to see the cost of discipleship. The definition of discipleship and the cost of discipleship. And my hope is that through these things, we see the worth of Jesus shining through in a way that that freshly captures our hearts and continues to change how we live our lives. So let's look at the first point this morning, the definition of discipleship. Verse 26, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me, and then notice in verse 27, he says, if anyone comes after me. And so Jesus defines discipleship as coming to him and as coming after him. It's coming to him and it is coming after him. And so I think this shows us that discipleship is both relational and it is directional. Discipleship has both a relational definition and a directional definition. A relational and a directional. Let's look at the relational side of this. Jesus is not here saying that his disciples are those who follow a certain set of of ritual acts, certain religious practices, nor does he say they're even those who have a certain kind of mindset. He says his followers are those who come to him. Like, They want to be with Jesus. Discipleship is about relationship with Jesus. It's relational. Jesus wants us to come to him, to to know him. Not not just information about who he is, but to know him in a relational way. He doesn't want just to open a book and see things that get said about who he is. He wants us to know these things in our hearts, to to know and to have a relationship with who He is. He he wants us to know Him in a relational way. And if you think about this, this is incredible. 
Because since Jesus has said he is God, what he is inviting us to here is to have a relationship with God himself. And this is fundamentally different from religion. Right? Religion is about what other people say God is like, and here's how you get to God. And so they have sacred texts that say, hey, here's what God's like, and here's how you get to God. That's fundamentally different than what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is not pointing people to God. That's what religion does. Religion points people to God. Jesus is not pointing people to God. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm God. If you want a relationship with God, you need to get to know me. He's saying, come to me. Come to me. He's not pointing to something outside of himself. He is pointing to himself. He's saying, I've come to give you a relationship with God because I am God. Being a discipleship of Jesus is relational. It means that we, have, we can know the Creator personally. He's not separate from us, but wants to have a relationship with us. Discipleship is, is a relational thing. It's also a directional thing. Jesus says, come to me. And then he also says, come after me. Right? So that means he's in a certain place, and he wants us to come after him. He wants us to walk on the path that he has set before us. And so discipleship is about seeking to follow Jesus, to walk in the way that he wants us to walk. And the relational aspect and directional aspect of of discipleship, they go hand in hand if you think about it. Right? It's because we have a relationship with Jesus that we should want to follow Jesus. Right? It's because we know who he is that we want to trust and do what he says. Earlier this week, I had a pair of, um, of headphones that went totally kibbutz, and uh, they, they died, they, they, they crapped out on me. And so since so much of, of my communication now is on the phone or on webcast, I need to get a new pair ASAP. Um, but I don't believe in Amazon reviews. I think they're all skewed and paid for by people, um, to, you know, the company to do it. So I don't believe what Amazon says. And I certainly was not going to go out on the street and like, look for a random stranger and ask them their opinion. One, there's not many that random strangers roaming the streets right now. And two, uh, you know, we need to keep a certain set of distance between each other. And three, that's just a dumb idea because I don't know who they are. Why should I trust what they say? So what I do, I went to my friend Matt Slingerlin, who had just gotten a new pair of earbuds that he had been bragging about and, and loved, and I asked more of his opinion about it. And what I do, I went out and I got the same exact pair, right? It was my relationship with him that determined the direction I chose to take. It's because I knew who he was that I trusted what he had to say. And that's what Jesus is laying out here, that if we come to him, if we know who he is, if we have a relationship with him, then we should want to come after him because we trust who he is and what he has to say. Our relationship with Jesus should lead us to go in the direction that he has set for us. Jesus says this pretty succinctly in another biography written about him in the Gospel of John. He says, if you love me, relationship, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Right? Discipleship is both relational and it is directional. And to drive this point home, Jesus gives two examples of how discipleship is both relational and directional. He, he talks about the relational side of it. As he says in verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now that comes at us pretty harshly, right? But, but we have to understand what Jesus is saying here. By, by hate... Jesus certainly doesn't mean that we're actually to hate our own family and to hate hate our own lives. No, no, earlier on, if you flip back a little bit in chapter 6, Jesus actually says that we are to love everyone. Even, he says, love your enemies. He says, do good to those who hate you, Luke 6, 27. And so if we're to love our enemies, then certainly Jesus wants us to love even our own families. Jesus' message clearly was to love one another. But, but here's what we have to understand about what he's saying here as he talks about hating these types of people. In, in that day, your family was considered the most important relationship that you had. 
Family units often even lived together all in one roof. And so you'd have grandparents and parents and their children all staying in the same place. Family was what was most important to your life. So much so that you'd even lay down your own life for your family. And so when Jesus is talking about family, and when he's talking about our life, he's speaking about two things that were the most dear things to his hearers. He was speaking about the things that under normal circumstances they would have said that they love the most. And, And so here's what he is doing. Commentator John Stott helps us understand it by saying this. He says, Jesus' meaning is that the love the disciple has for him must be so great that the best of earthly loves is hatred by comparison. Jesus is not commanding us to hate our families. He's saying that the love we have for him should be so profoundly different that anything else... Even the most deep love we can have on earth is considered hatred by comparison. Another commentator, Boston, Thomas Boston, said it this way, No man can be a true disciple of Christ to whom Christ is not dearer than what is most dearest to him in the world. Right? Jesus is saying family and life, they were what were most important, but Jesus is saying that he is worthy of being even more important. And, and not just like he's number one and they're second. No, he's saying... He needs to be more important in the sense that we are to love Him with such a deep and profound manner that loving Him is fundamentally different than any kind of way we would use the word love to anyone else. You know, we have a human analogy for this, right? Like, when I tell my wife Angie that I love her, I mean that in a far different way than when I tell my friends that I love them. Right? It's, it's a fundamentally different kind of love. And, and as I say, as Angie t- wants that, right? She wants that fundamentally different kind of love. She doesn't want me to love her in the way that I love my friends or even the way that I love other family members. Like she wants exclusive claim on my deepest love. And that's her right to do so. And, and in fact, if I didn't love her in such a way, quite frankly, I'm not worthy to be her husband. Something I say to my daughter all the time is that you're not allowed to marry anyone who doesn't love you more than daddy does, right? Like, I love her incredibly, and I want her to know that she's not worthy, that there's not a person who's worthy to marry her unless that person loves her in a completely different category than even me. And I can't fathom what that category is, but I'm believing that somehow, someday, there's going to be a person out there who does love her that way, and that's how she'll know that he is worthy of her. That's what Jesus is saying here. He is saying that he is worthy of our deepest love. He is saying that he deserves more than just being one thing, even the first thing on a list of other things. You know, we love Jesus, and we love family, and we love food, we love sports. You know, he's saying, no, he deserves far more than even just being the first thing on our list. He deserves to be in a completely different category all by himself. Jesus does not just want to be number one in your life. He does not. He does not want to be number one in your life. If he was just number one in your life, then, then you could go to church, you could read your Bibles, you could pray, and you could check the Jesus box and then move on to other things. But here Jesus is saying that he doesn't just want to be number one in our lives in a way that, that hey, we love him first, but then we move on to loving other things. No, he wants us to love him in a way that is completely central to all of our life. He, he's not number one on the list it's more like he is central in the way that he is the, he is the hub of a wheel that all the spokes are coming off of. Like he wants to be in a category completely separate unto himself through which everything else in our life is defined by him. He's not first on the list, but he is central. And so Jesus is, it's not like we love Jesus first, and then we go to, you know, think about how we want to use our money. No, it's we love Jesus centrally, and so how we love our money is defined, or how we use our money is defined by how we love him. It's not like we love Jesus first, and then we, we move on to love other people. It's no, we love Jesus centrally, and how we love other people is defined by how we love him. 
It's not we love Jesus first and we try our best to give him the best of our time, but then, you know, we also have our careers and other things we're pursuing. No, it's we love Jesus centrally and how we're pursuing our careers and the choices we're making in the everyday stuff of life that gets defined by the love we have for him. Jesus wants to be our reference point for everything. Not first on the list, but central to our lives. Being a disciple of Jesus means that everything in our life is defined by our relationship with Him. And because of our relationship, because of this this deep relationship that we have with Jesus, where He is just central to everything about who we are, do you see how, because of relationship with Him, this relational aspect then leads to a directional aspect. And this is what Jesus goes on to say. He first, in verse 26, talks about how He's a category unto Himself, That's the relational. In verse 27, he goes on to give the directional as he says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You see what he's saying? See, when we love Jesus centrally in our lives, then we should be willing to follow him no matter where he leads and no matter what that might cost us. Jesus, by saying that this could mean even going to the cross, he's using what to his hearers would have been like a worst case scenario. Nothing in the ancient world was as bad as a cross. We, we get so used to seeing a cross everywhere that, that we can lose uh, the, 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 the real horror of what the cross was. In the ancient world, the cross was the most cruel and torturous form of execution that there was. It it was considered so horrendous that it was actually illegal for Roman citizens to be executed by a cross. Like no matter how heinous their crime, a cross was considered beneath their dignity because it was just that disgusting of a thing. I mean, just to get quickly into it, a cross, how you died is your, your hands and feet would be hung to a piece of wood that would then be propped up And how you die would be either one, blood loss, or two, suffocation. Because as you're hanging, your whole weight is going down, compressing upon your lungs, and you're struggling to get a breath. And the only way to get really get a breath is to use your wrists that have nails going through them to pull up, have an excruciating pain in order to get a breath. And actually that word excruciating is a word that comes from the word cross. Right? It was literally a word that was, that was invented to describe the pain that comes from the cross. It comes from the Latin word ex, ex meaning out of or from, and crux meaning cross. That word excruciating literally is pain of the cross. And so when Jesus is saying, then unless we're willing to go to the cross, we're not really following Him. He, he's saying that if you aren't willing to endure even something as horrendously torturous as that, if, if you're going to follow Me, but only up to a certain point, then you're not really understanding how worthy I am. Jesus is saying, if I'm not worth you giving everything for, then you don't really know who I am. Now for many of his original hearers, as Jesus talks about this, this isn't going to be just a figure of speech for him. Them, This this is not just going to be hyperbole. For many of them, they actually would meet their death because of their choice to follow Jesus. It became illegal to be a Christian in the Roman Empire, and so they were regularly executed, often in places like the Colosseum where they were hunted down and, 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 and torn apart by dogs or born, uh, burned at a stake or, or hung upon a cross. And actually, one of the greatest proofs of the truth of Jesus is people's willingness to die for their testimony that He rose from the grave. It, it's really wild because when Jesus first died on the cross, His followers, they all fled. They all went into hiding. Right? They, they didn't think that was going to happen. And so when it happened, they were terrified. They were like, man, Jesus died. You know, the, our leader is gone. 
uh, we better go hide, right? This whole thing, we, we thought he was God, but clearly he's not because God can't die. And so they went into hiding. But then three days later, they come out of hiding. Three days later, they are changed into bold proclaimers. Why? Because three days later, they realized that, oh yeah, you can't actually kill God. Jesus did die on the cross, but then he took back his life to prove that he is God. And those who were most terrified of what was going to happen to them became the most bold proclaimers of Jesus, willing to even die for saying they'd seen him rise from the grave. And listen, people lie for all kinds of things, for all kinds of purposes, but generally they're they're doing it because they want something good to happen to them. Like, no one dies for something they, they know to be a lie. But these people were willing to die for what they're saying is true. Their willingness to be martyrs is one of the great testimonies to the truthfulness that they actually did see Jesus. These disciples were going to have to take up a cross to follow Jesus. For many of us, we don't. You know, I don't know many places that... That, that people are dying these days on crosses. Um, I certainly don't think that's an option here in the, in the U.S. And so I don't think that's a future that we have to look forward to. But we do have to understand that following Jesus is never going to be easy. Following Jesus is never going to be easy. No matter what time period you're living in, no matter what country you're living in, no matter what city you're living in, following Jesus is never going to be easy because the current of this world is going away from Him. And so if we're seeking to go in the direction that He set, we're always going against the current. And so as you follow Jesus, you're going to go against the current and that will result in hardship. That will potentially result in you being mocked for your faith. That could result in you being passed over for a promotion because people like your work, but they don't really trust this whole he's a Jesus person thing. That could lead to you losing friendships because you're not going to act in certain ways that people who you love dearly act. And even though you're not trying to judge them at all, they would rather not deal with you than be around you and you not participate in what they're doing. You you could lose friendships for following Jesus. You might lose contact with family sometimes. There can be estrangement from family. As we choose to love Jesus, some family can be threatened by that. And there can be tension. You know, we very intentionally live here in the city because we want to start this church and tell people about Jesus. And so we're here, and, and usually living in the city is very easy. We, we love living in the city. It's a joy. Uh, but I'll tell you what, when there was a shooting like 50 feet from my block this summer, I think it was like 30 shell casings, uh, my family had left my house about 10 minutes before and walked past that intersection like they could have been on the street. Like, I felt like, man, I think it might be time to move back to the safety of the suburbs. <laughs> uh, I think it might be time to, to leave this hard place. But Jesus never said following him was going to be easy. You know, and, and this just goes against everything in us because I think in many ways, in a unique way, the American life is all about avoiding hard things. Right? Our culture is really bad at doing things that are hard. We don't have a very good stick to itness. It's like, hey, if this isn't working, I'm just going to move on to the next thing. And, and just life is about making things as easy and as comfortable for myself as possible. But Jesus is saying the exact opposite of that. He's saying, hey, listen, being his disciple might mean not avoiding hard things, but actually sometimes it might mean going directly into hard things as we seek to follow him. Being a disciple is both relational and is both directional. That's the definition of discipleship. It means that Jesus is our everything, and so we want to go in the way that he has set to us. A disciple is someone who comes to Jesus and who comes after Jesus. That's the definition of discipleship. Let's look now at the cost of discipleship. The cost of discipleship. What Jesus is saying is certainly heavy, and he wants us to feel like it's heavy. 
Right? Because that's why he goes on to say in verse 28, which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? Right? Jesus is telling people here to count the cost of being his disciple. He's not trying to sell them. Right? He's not trying to say, hey, listen, it's not that big a deal. He's not a used car salesman who's saying, hey, don't look under the hood. Don't really look at the guts of this. Let, let me just make this look shiny and appealable to you. No, that's not what he's saying. He, he's not saying, hey, listen, like, hey, what do you have to lose? Just try it out. It's no big deal. No, he's saying, this is a big deal. You need to count the cost of what it means to follow me. Are you sure you really want to do this? Are you sure you, you're going to be able to, to not just have a, a few moments of faith? Are you sure that this is something that you want to give your whole life to, to the finish? There's a, a, a big house back in New Jersey, and actually a really nice neighborhood. Um, I used to live in New Jersey, and I used to drive by this house all the time. And, and what's interesting about it, it's surrounded by all these gorgeous mount, mansions, but this house is only half built. It's only half built. It's been that way for about 10 years. What happened was the builder got into it and, and then ran out of funds to complete it. And so now you have this kind of half-built mansion that's just rotting away. And, and I read actually recently that, uh, that the builder is being sued to have it torn down because it's such an eyesore, the neighbors are getting upset. The builder bit off more than he chew and, and he couldn't... And he couldn't finish it. He didn't count the cost, and so the project was a disaster. Jesus does not want us to be like that. He he does not want us to be those who um, do not finish the race. He he does not want us to be those who, like that builder, end up being mocked (laughs) for not having thought it all the way through. Jesus wants us to count the cross, he cost. He does not want our faith to be a half-built building that will eventually get torn down. He wants us to count the cost. But as you think about that, what are, what are we doing when we're counting the cost of something? We're seeing if it's worth the price, right? Like when I counted the cost of buying my home here, I did research on the neighborhood. I compared it to the prices of other homes. Like I thought, is this is this house and the asking price for it, is it worth what, it's, what they're asking for? Right? When we're counting the cost, we're determining the value of something. And so as Jesus tells us to count the cost of following him, he's not saying, hey, just think about how hard it will be. He's saying, think about how valuable I am. He's asking us to consider his worth. He's asking us to consider who he is. I think often when we think about counting the cost, we just think about, oh, am I really willing to endure all the hard things? That's not just the only thing Jesus is saying. He's saying, yeah, you need to think about enduring the hard things, but you need to ask yourself the question, am I worth it? Like, what is my value? How do you price me? As we think about the worth of Jesus Luke in his biography, already in these 14 chapters that we've gone through over this past year, he has been spelling out for us, if we've been paying attention, he's been spelling out for us the great worth of Jesus. He starts in chapter 1 by saying Jesus is a certainty. He, he can be an unshakable foundation in an unstable world. In Luke chapter 2, he says Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise to give his people a sign that he's going to be God with them by coming and being born of a virgin. In Luke chapters 3 and 4, Jesus is the one who comes to defeat, uh, who overcomes the defeat that the first human Adam suffered in the garden by defeating the temptation of Satan in the desert. And from that victory, he goes on to proclaim good news to the spiritually poor, to the spiritually crippled, to the lame, to the deaf, to the blind. He says there is freedom in life in him. And then he moves on in Luke chapter 5 to talk about how he is the healer who comes to not only take away people's sicknesses, but also their shame through offering acceptance and love in himself. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus is the one who gives not not the tyranny of religious law, but rather the freedom of a new life of living in his kingdom. 
In Luke chapter 7, Jesus is the one who forgives sins, who those who are condemned on earth are set free by divine pardon. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus stops a storm with his voice, showing his power over nature. He casts a demon out of a man possessed, showing his power over the spiritual realm. And he raises a dead person to life, showing his power over death itself. In chapter 9, Jesus shows us a a glimpse of his glory as he is transfigured on this mount and his appearance becomes so bright that, that those who are with him can't even look at him. But then he doesn't stay on that mount. He comes down and he speaks about how he is going to humble himself to suffer and die on the cross for the sins of the people that he loves. In chapter 10, uh, 10, Jesus is the good Samaritan who doesn't pass by us in our need, but instead comes to us and meets us where we're at and shows us true neighbor love. In chapter 11, Jesus is the one who shows us the path to living the light and the way through the narrow door of heaven. In chapter 12, Jesus is the one who gives us heavenly reward that will not crash like earthly riches. In chapter 13, Jesus is the one who sows the mustard seed of his kingdom that he promises is going to spread throughout the whole earth the way that yeast spreads throughout dough. And earlier in this chapter, in chapter 14, Jesus offers a great feast and he throws this invitation open to anyone who's willing to come to him and have their soul's hunger met by him. Anyone, the outsider, the unlikely, no matter who you are, Jesus says you can have a seat at his table by grace. And so friends, if you think about it, we have seen that Jesus is the welcomer of the outsider. He is the healer of the broken. He is the lifter of the shamefaced. He is the forgiver of sinners. He is the eternal life bringer and the unshakable kingdom establisher. He is God, exalted, transcendent, creator of all, who became humbled and lowly and stepped into creation. He is the greatest being that there is, who committed the greatest act that could ever be, as He gave His holy, divine life for our sinful life and suffered the fate that we deserve on the cross. And so Jesus is unimaginable love. He is indescribable beauty. He is unfathomable worth. That is Jesus. That is His value. And so as Jesus calls us to count the cost of being His disciple, He wants us to know that He is worth it. He wants us to know that He is worth it. He he doesn't want us to settle for a half built faith. He wants us to know that He is worth giving our whole lives to because there is nothing that compares to the value of who He is. He wants us to count the cost and consider His worth. And He wants us to count the cost, not just of being His disciple, He wants us to count the cost of not being His disciple. This is what He says in verse 31 as He talks about the King who goes out to encounter another king at war and says, will they not first sit down and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Right? This is the other side of what Jesus is saying in verse 30. He, here he's saying there's this weaker king who, who needs to consider what it will cost him to not make peace with the stronger king. Like, can he afford to wage war? Jesus knows that we can't afford to wage war with God. To not live with faith in Jesus is to live with faith in something else, which means that we are fundamentally then opposed to God. It doesn't mean we're necessarily bad people doing bad things. It just means that God is not on the throne of our hearts. And that is, by definition, war against God. And Jesus is saying, don't wage that war. Count the cost of what it's going to be to wage that war. You can't afford to be at war with God because you'll you'll always lose. But notice, he says, what what does he do? He says, you need to count that you can't do that. So why? So that you can go and make peace. Right? That's why he's saying this. Jesus is the king who has come to offer us peace terms. He's come to offer us peace with God himself. But here's the terms of his peace. Here's the terms of his peace. Total surrender. Total surrender. That's the only kind of peace 
that Jesus accepts. He accepts the peace terms of total surrender. He draws our attention to this in verse 33. As he says, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. This isn't saying that we can't have personal possessions. He's saying that there's nothing that we should not be willing to give to him. He's saying that discipleship is not kind of just part of your life, just, just one thing that you do. No, discipleship is meant to be our whole life. Not just something that we do. It's supposed to be part of the fundamental nature of who we are. All that we have. All that we are. Total surrender to Christ. That's His peace terms. And to illustrate the the nature of being totally surrendered to Him. Of Him having all of us. He he gives an illustration from the ancient world of cooking. and And of fertilizing. He says in verse 34 and 35... Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears, let him hear. Right? So salt was used in times as, as a preservative and, and as flavorful. And so uh, salt can't lose its properties. There's no way for salt to not be salt. But in ancient times, if you had salt, it, it, it only worked if it was pure salt. Right? If you had salt that could be mixed with other minerals, those other minerals would, would take away the effect that the salt had. And so the only kind of salt that was good salt was salt that was only salt. It was salt that was unmixed with other things. Once it was mixed with other things, it was of really no use for anything. And so salt was only good if it is only salt. And so Jesus is saying that if we want to follow him, that we need to be only for him. If we want to follow him, then we need to be only for him. He doesn't want to be mixed in with a bunch of other things. No, the only terms he has for relationship with us is that he has all of us. All of us. A guy named Abraham Kuyper says it this way. There is not one decision we make, not one part of our lives that we have, that Jesus does not cry out, this is mine, this belongs to me. And so our relationships belong to Jesus. I'm not just a husband and father and brother and son. No, I must follow how Jesus wants me to be a husband and father and friend and brother and son. Like, I don't bring definition to those relationships. He does. Our careers belong to Jesus. Like, what we do and how we do it should be shaped by being a follower of Jesus. Our finances belong to Jesus. (laughs) Some of you are going to show that you know, today by giving online or by sending in a check to support our, our work here that we're doing for Jesus, right? Our finances, why do we do that? Because we're saying our finances belong to Jesus. Our, our calendars belong to Jesus. Our time is given to us by God, and so how we spend our time is dictated to us, should be dictated to us by God. And so our children's extracurricular activities is not about giving them all the best opportunities they can have. It's how does God want me to use the time that I have here with my children? How does God speak into that? Right? Our, our calendars belong to Jesus. How, how we interact with other people belong to Jesus. I'm not just to interact with someone based upon who they are. I'm to interact with them based upon who I am. I'm a follower of Jesus. And so regardless of who they are, I must treat them with love, dignity, and respect. Our careers belong to Jesus. Our dreams belong to Jesus. Our future plans belong to Jesus. Friends, the cost of being a follower of Jesus is that everything is His. But friends, He's worth that cost. He he wants it all, but He is worth it. Worth it all. And you know what? It's God's love that He wants all of our love. It's God's love that He wants all of us. Like, like I'm not turned off by the fact that my wife wants all my devotion. Like, that's actually, to me, a sign that, that we're still good after 12 years of marriage. You know, if she were to come up to me tomorrow and say, hey, listen, Jeff, it's been a great, a great 12 years. We've had a good run. Um, and, and I want you to know you're still number one in my life. I love you so much. But, uh, but there's also these other guys I want to start loving too. Um, like, like if that happened, well, first of all, there's a, a few other guys who are about to die. Um, and, then, and then also, like, all of a sudden, I'm like, what, what is going on in our relationship, right? 
Like, if she's like, hey, listen, no, no, don't get upset. Like, I love you, but I just love these other people too. And so as long as you stay in your place, as long as you stay in your box, like, I'll love you at certain times throughout the week. But then, you know, the rest of the times throughout the week, I'm going to love these other things too. Right? Like, that, that's not going to be okay. Like, she is, clearly does not actually love me the way that a wife is supposed to love her husband. Like, that's not good. The fact that she wants me to love, the fact that, 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 that she and I are exclusive in our love with one another, that's a good thing. That's a sign of a healthy relationship. Like, I wouldn't feel loved if Angie said, I love you just first, but I, I'm going to be devoted to these other things too. You can have me, but not all of me. Like, it's, it's her desire to want all of me. It's her, it's her desire to say, hey, listen, Jeff, I want all of your devotion. I want all of your attention. I want all of your love. I want to be first in your heart. I, I want you to, to think about me. It's the fact that she wants that still after 12 years of marriage. The fact that she still wants all of me, that shows me that, yeah, I think we're still good. I, I think our relationship is still healthy. Friends, Jesus wants all of us because he wants our relationship to be good. He, he wants all of us because he loves us that much. He loves us that much. And so this call to give it all of our lives to Jesus, this is the most loving thing that Jesus could say to us. This is the most loving thing that he could do. He knows his great value and worth. He knows that anything else is going to be less by definition. And so in an infinite act of love, he says, hey, come to me because your deepest joy, the, the, the strongest longings of your hearts and souls desire, they will never be met in anything else except for me. And so God wants us to come to him so that because he loves us and he wants us to know the satisfaction of having him. There's a hymn, maybe you've heard of, maybe not, but it's called I've Decided to Follow Jesus. Uh, it's a beautiful hymn. Not many people know, though, that this is based off a life of a, a real man, actually, uh, who lived in the 19th century in uh, a place called, I'm probably saying this wrong, but Assam, it's, it's in northeast India. He, he lived in a village, and, and he was the first person in that village to be converted to Christianity. And when he converted to Christianity, uh, a, a missionary came and preached about Jesus, preached about Jesus' love. Only one man came to faith. It was this man. And when he professed his faith in Jesus, the village chief came and demanded immediately that he renounce his faith. But, but he replied to the village Chief, I have decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back. No turn back. And the little chief said, why are you doing this? No one is going to go with you. No one's going to join you. You're going to be all along. And he replied, though no one goes with me, still I will follow. No turning back. In an outrage, the chief had his family executed in front of him and then tied him to a stake and burned this man alive. And as he was dying, it's recorded, he said, the cross before me, the world behind me, I decide to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And we know this story because what ended up happening is the whole village, after seeing his testimony of faith, the whole village ended up becoming converted to Christianity. And they wrote the words to the hymn in a tribute to him. Let me read the words of this beautiful hymn. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back. No turning back. Oh, friends, I pray that we would decide to follow Jesus. Our mission as a church is to make mature and multiply disciples of Jesus Christ because we think He's worth it. And so I just want to ask right now to every single person who's watching this, it's not by chance that you're watching this. It's not by chance that you got sent this link by a friend or just decided to tune on or... Maybe you've been coming to our church physically for a little bit, but you have yet to define yourself as a Christian. We have lots of people who interact with our church who are just spiritually curious, and we welcome them. We want to be a safe place for people to explore the Christian faith. 
But if you have yet to decide to follow Jesus, I want to ask you this morning, will you come to Him? Our mission as a church is to make new disciples, mature disciples, and multiply disciples. And so make disciples mean that we want to see people who are not yet followers of Jesus become followers of Jesus. And if that is you today, I pray today would be the day of salvation for you. As you've had so many things in your life disrupted, as you've had so many things that you once thought were secure potentially be taken away from you, Oh, there is a worth and value in Jesus Christ that no stock market can crash, that can never be quarantined, that never goes out of business, that you can never be physically distant from. There's no social distancing from the love of Jesus Christ. He wants you to know Him, and He has you watching this because He wants you to know the value and worth of who He is. And so I've been praying that there would be people who would be made disciples today. Would you come to know Him? Would you come to know Jesus to see His great worth and to give your life to Him? And for those of us who have done that, for those of us who have been made disciples, well then we want to mature as disciples. I don't know about you, but every day is a day that I wake up and today I need to recommit my life to Christ because my heart is prone to go to other places. And so... I want to, every day I need to say no turning back, no turning back, because every day is a day where I'm tempted to turn back and to turn back. And so we as a church, we want to see new disciples made, and we want to see those who are disciples, we want to see them matured. And so I would just call on you, Christ Church, I would call on anyone watching this who has made a decision to follow Jesus, oh, continue to do so. No turning back. No turning back. No matter what comes against you, that is not greater than the value of who Christ is for you. No turning back. No turning back. Do not compromise. Do not live in fear. Do not look to other things. Look to Christ. Hold on to Christ. Celebrate the great worth of all who who He is. Now is your time for faith. Now more than ever before. There is no turning back, friends. No turning back. Continue to follow Jesus. And my prayer is that as new disciples are made and existing disciples are matured, that this would then be multiplied out throughout our city. That this would be multiplied out throughout our country. That this would be multiplied out throughout our world. That there would be more and more people who are coming to know the incomparable worth of Jesus Christ. That's what we're about as a church. Making and maturing and multiplying Jesus. And so my prayer is that we would know His great worth and give ourselves to Him. Holy, body, soul, mind, and heart. That we would give ourselves to Christ for He alone is worth it. Would you bow your heads with me and pray?